All right, it is 11.30 a.m. so we'll go ahead and get started with the presentation. So thanks everyone for being here. I see a lot of familiar names. Uh, Mr. Bill Crean, Bob Chapman, um, lots, of, lots of friends, uh, Kathy Mori, Ken Brock, Kevin Colsheen, Mark McGee. Welcome folks. I um, really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join us here uh, for our um, Laptimer Plus subscribers webinar. Um, this is our second uh, LTP subscribers webinar for the year. Um, the first one uh, was about uh, three or four months ago. Um, we're going to try to do these a little more frequently. Um, I know I've kind of made that commitment, but I will go ahead and get a date out for the next one um, when we wrap things up here so that we can um, progress and further the conversation. i uh, also run another poll on the Facebook group about the topic. Um, so thanks for those of you who are on the Laptimer Plus subscribers Facebook group. Um, and who voted for the topic for this webinar. So it's really kind of a community-driven um, focus. So if you don't know me, I'm Andrew Ainge with Apex Pro. Um, obviously, you're familiar with Apex Pro because you're a Laptimer Plus subscriber, so we greatly appreciate uh, you subscribing um, to the paid features within the Apex Pro app. Uh, and today we're gonna cover um, three of those features specifically and drill into more detail and allow for some question and answer about um, getting the most out of those features, specific questions that you have about them, um, and also, you know, any any questions or feedback that you have uh, in your experience. Um, we'll all operate on the assumption that we're on the latest version of the app, which is app version 7710, uh, and actually app version 780 with some really minor changes is coming out uh, today or tomorrow. So make sure you have your automated app updates uh, enabled in your phone. Um, and you will always be on the latest version of the app. Um, really important note before we get started, if you're running a device uh, that's also using Laptimer Plus that doesn't have cellular connection, that's a Wi-Fi enabled device like an iPad. Um, you know, I have my iPad over here that doesn't have cellular, it operates off of the Wi-Fi. Uh, it doesn't get automatic updates as quickly as a device on cellular because I have to actually use it connected to Wi-Fi uh, and give the app store long enough for it to recognize, for the device to recognize that the app needs to be updated. Um, and sometimes that can take a little while, especially if the Wi-Fi is slow or the signal strength is, is poor. Um, so just make sure when you get onto your iPad or your non-cellular enabled iPhone uh, or your device, um, a lot of times, you know, recently we had some app bugs. A lot of times you might think you're on the latest app, but if your device doesn't have cellular, it might just not have updated yet. Um, it does take them time, and you've noticed this with other apps, I'm sure, for the device to communicate with the App Store server and to, you know, recognize that it actually needs an update. Um, so housekeeping out of the way, let's go over the agenda for today. So it's really simple. It's going to be three items, and then I'll talk about how you guys can communicate with us on the webinar. Um, this is being recorded. It's live on the Facebook group, um, and this will also be on YouTube afterwards. So we're gonna cover uh, creating and defining sectors. So how to do that in the app. I'll show you some shortcuts. I'll share my opinion and my preferred way of defining sectors, particularly with what I've done the past couple of events that I've run and how I found value in it. Um, then we'll cover video. Uh, and in the Apex Pro world, uh, video obviously is gonna be using the camera on our iPhone uh, in a phone mount and then we're gonna be able to automatically sync the video and the data together. We'll show that interface and look at it. Uh, I'll share some tips. We've made some changes to it recently. So I'll share what those changes do. Um, posted a video recently on YouTube that's with some of, those, some of those changes. So if you haven't used the app in the past two weeks, um, the video uh, part's gonna be slightly different, but vastly improved in my opinion. Uh, and then lastly, we'll talk about the additional data channels that you get with the Laptimer Plus subscription. So you might have noticed that uh, there's some channels that are red when you go through the channel selector in data review. Um, and it's either because you don't have two laps overlaid, like gain loss, you know, to have a time delta, you have to have two laps overlaid, or it's because it's a Laptimer Plus feature. Uh, so we will cover that last. Um, please feel free to ask questions as we, as we go through the presentation. Um, to do that, um, try not to ask those in the chat box. Uh, I've got Baker monitoring the chat, but it's easy to miss those in the chat box. If you go to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little Q&A area. If you go in there and enter a question, 
that will pop up. I'll get a notification and then I'll be able to hit it once I've answered it so that we can answer every question that you have. Um, great. Without further ado, I'm going to share my phone screen over. We're going to be using an iPhone. Uh, this is an iPhone 11. doesn't really matter, but I'm going to be using an iPhone instead of an iPad for uh, the conversation here. Um, there are some small differences in the user interface uh, on the iPad, obviously. A um, little more functionality on the data review side of things. So I will go ahead and share the screen and we'll get started. Hopefully everyone's doing well, staying healthy, and uh, having had a good Thanksgiving um, without COVID, ideally. I got tested this morning, negative, going to CODA this weekend. Awesome. So before we go into uh, creating and defining sectors, I just want to mention a change that was made recently that I think impacts all of us as Laptimer Plus subscribers. And that is when you tap the Laptimer Plus icon on the home screen after you've purchased it, instead of it being a promotion, it's going to tell you how to access the features. Um, so you'll see all the icons that are only for Laptimer Plus features. So really what you can queue into here is if you see any one of these icons anywhere in the app, that is for Laptimer Plus. If you don't have Laptimer Plus, when you tap those icons, uh, they won't do anything, right? Um, so here, instead of having, you know, bound by Laptimer Plus, it's awesome, here's what it does. Now it's, you've bought Laptimer Plus, here's how to access your new features. Um, hopefully that, uh, that, you know, answers some questions for you. If you have any questions about your subscription or about how to subscribe, or obviously you click one of these to subscribe, and you're all here because you've already done that, but feel free to email us. I'm happy to help you out. Uh, we're not too proud to explain, um, you know, the features on your phone that you need to, how you can check your subscription, those kinds of things. All right, so the first thing we're going to look at is sectors. So we'll go into data, and if you have your device in front of you, I always recommend you follow along because we'll build some muscle memory with what icons to tap and when, um, and that way it'll be a little easier next time you go to do it. You can also reference this video, um, or you can make notes on a notepad. Um, that always helps as well because uh, as the app gets more powerful, um, we're trying to balance simplicity and power, right? It's with great power comes great responsibility. So um, at a certain point, you have to kind of weigh the, weigh the scales there. Um, so go into any data session. doesn't really matter which one. I'm going to use this uh, recent session. This was last week in Barber um, in a Mini Cooper. Really fun little car. Um, and I'm going to tap this icon in the top. You've probably seen it. Most of you have probably already tapped it and opened it. But that little uh, kind of quadrilateral shape, someone can correct me on my geometry but that, that shape is going to be uh, the sector editing interface. So when we open that, we're gonna see this page. So this is how we create our sectors. So the sector is essentially gonna break the lap up into chunks. Um, it's just going, going to you know, basically time little laps as we go throughout the lap. So there's a couple of things to talk about here that are really important. Um, one, I have an entire video about defining sectors and some of the theory behind it. Um, I'll send it uh, out when we send the follow-up email here so that you can, if you really want to go into more detail here and hear more opinions and more thoughts on this, you can. Um, some of you are familiar with sectors from other software. It works essentially the same way. Um, there's a lot that we have yet to do that we are going to do with sectors. So if you're restraining, asking a bunch of questions about what the future looks like and how we can do more and more and more with sectors, that's great. I appreciate it. We've got a whole plan for how we're going to integrate more sector timing functionality, but again, balancing power with, with ease of use. So right now, what sector timings are going to do for you is allow you to define custom sectors that are going to work best for you, uh, and then allow you to see the times in those sectors. And then the time, if you added up your best sector throughout the session, best sectors throughout the session, which is your optimal. Um, so to define our sectors, we get to choose the number of sectors with this slider right here. So I can move this around and I can go all the way up to 12 sectors. I can go all the way down to two sectors, right? So you can define anything in between. Now at any point when you're editing sectors, if you get in here and you're like, okay, I'm lost. I don't remember what to do. You can just have default and that's going to go back to just five sectors randomly selected throughout the track. 
every track comes with a default. We didn't predetermine it. It's just evenly spaced sectors. Um, I would recommend editing the sectors before you look at your sector times uh, and your optimal lap um, because it's going to be different for everybody. We felt that um, there, are, there are other products that auto-define <laughs> sectors. We've not found that technology to be reliable at this point with the way that we think it's best for you. So instead, I urge you to go into this interface and define your sector so that you want to. Uh, so I usually use no more than six sectors, usually five. Um, for Barbara, I think I use six because it splits the lap up a little bit more um, the way that I want to, to split it up. Um, I would urge against using 10 or 12 sectors. Now, if you do use 10 or 12 sectors, you'll notice that your optimal is going to be vastly improved, right? But it's going to be less realistic um, because it's basically splitting the lap up. There's more opportunity for you to do different stuff and it's going to combine all those sectors together with all your optimals, right? More sectors, um, you're going to have different spreads in your, in your, you know, best sectors and it's going to make your optimal look a little bit better. Um, since you actually didn't do your optimal, that doesn't really matter, right? We wanted to find it in an accurate way. And by accurate, I mean a way that uh, where your sectors are set so that you're not doing different stuff every time in the sector, right? There's some consistency. So we want to avoid setting a sector split in the middle of a corner or in the middle of a breaking zone. So think about, you know, when you cross the start finish line, if you're accelerating at a high rate of speed, you might have gotten on the throttle earlier or later out of the previous corner and you could be accelerating much quicker or much slower lap to lap, right? That's gonna change your lap time significantly, right? Um, if anyone's familiar with Mid-Ohio, excellent example. That's a track where on your qualifying lap, because the start finish straight's not super long, uh, it's fairly close to the lap, last corner, you slow down your entry speed your minimum speed to the last corner and get a mega exit, one that you probably you know, exaggerated past what you would normally do, right? Because that's gonna get you running at a higher speed crossing the stripe. Then on that end of that lap, you bomb the entry of that corner and basically ignore the exit because you're not gonna be able to make up enough time by getting a better exit. You're gonna carry a higher minimum speed and probably by the time you get to the start finish, you're gonna be at a higher speed than if you would have focused on the exit. Um, think of that that's what sectors that's how sectors can be kind of you can manipulate them right so if you set them someplace where you're changing direction you're changing acceleration they're going to be very inconsistent and that's going to boost your optimal unrealistically we want to use the optimal as a tool to help us improve that's a realistic goal right that's a second or two from our fastest lap sometimes a little better so I'm gonna go through and set these sectors and just explain my thought process. So for me at Barber and at any track, the track map's great, but if you toggle over here to the speed trace, it's gonna show a speed trace instead of the GPS outline of the track. The reason this is important is because this is how you can set sectors so that you're not in the middle of a braking zone or a corner. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna set sectors where I'm accelerating, about to break, but not right at the braking zone. That way, every time I trip that sector, I'm accelerating at a fairly slow rate, right near the end of the straightaway. I'm not braking yet, I'm not cornering ideally. You can be cornering a little, but you get the idea. So at Barber, my first sector is always this run down the front straightaway, the braking zone for turn one, and then right here before I break for turn two. And you can do this, it applies to every track, right? Your home track's gonna be the same. So that's where I'm going to stop that sector. And to move that dot, I just slide the little slider here. Same thing for the second sector. All right, I'm going to define the second sector right before the braking zone for turn five, which is right here. But that gives us a nice 10 to 15 second, maybe 20 second sector. Okay, you don't want them to be too short. If they're five seconds, it's too short, right? If they're 50 seconds, it's too long. I like a nice 15 to 20, sometimes 25 second sector. And I'm gonna move the sector three slider, right? Before the breaking zone of the next one. It helps to, to know and think about the track um, while you're doing this because you might be working on something specific. So what I just, the information I just gave you is kind of the overarching idea about setting sectors. Set sectors where you're accelerating at a slow rate, 
you're not breaking, you're not cornering aggressively. That's general good behavior for setting sectors, but also consider the areas that you're working on. So like an area of the track that's a specific goal for you. Um, if you're specifically looking at turn one and your minimum speed in turn one, getting on the throttle early, optimizing that corner is really important. Define a sector before the braking zone in turn one and well past track out and just track that time, right? You might manipulate your sectors depending on what you're working on. So if you, if you ring me up, you know, send an email and say, hey, Andrew, look at my data. Let's do some data review and talk about Road Atlanta or let's talk about Watkins Glen or let's talk about Laguna Seca. And we drill into it and we find three places on the track where there's big opportunity. You might go adjust your sectors to capture those three specific corners or combination of corners. So think about it as well before you just do exactly what I'm doing here. Um, this is just the theory behind why I do it. So you'll notice the theme. You'll see the little sector defining dots will be close to the top of the speed trace, but I want to be far enough before the top of the speed trace that I'm always still accelerating through that point, right? If you do it right on the peak, right on the peak of the speed trace, that can create the most variation, right? Because if you are behind a car, you're going to break well before that. If you're unimpeded, you're going to break after that potentially. And that's going to change your sector time sometimes very dramatically, which is going to unfairly influence your optimal so that it's less achievable, so that it's less realistic. I'm hoping that the way I'm explaining it is making sense. So this is what I would look at sector time wise for Barber. Now if I go back to the track map, now you can see where those are. They're in straight parts of the track before braking zones, right? That way I'm measuring at Barber, this turn five complex is very important, right? This is a threshold breaking corner. It's downhill on the entry, uphill on the exit. If you break um, way too late, it's easy to totally just, just mess up your entire lap time. If you break way too early, it's easy to overslow. If you get on the throttle too early, you have to get back out of it, right? If you get on the throttle too late, you have a terrible exit. It's very, 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 very important for a good lap time. So I want to define this specific area and for me, especially even now, but if I was, you know, someone who's earlier in your driving career, you're only doing this for a couple of years, this is the type of corner that I would be, you know, really sure to measure your consistency on. If you're three seconds different there, right, that's a huge, huge opportunity uh, for improvement. You should be, you know, within a few tenths in that tight of a window, right, in that small of a sector. So obviously, the next step here is to save your sectors. You're going to save them to the track. So now what you've done is saved sectors so that every sector, every um, session that you do at that track is going to have the same sectors. Uh, now, if you use the, the lap timer ticker right here, you can go look at where the sectors are on the track. So now you're going to see different colors correlated with where those sectors are that we just saw. Okay. So now the, the question bag is obviously, how do I look at my sector times? We're going to tap the arrow on the right side of the screen. And we're going to go all the way to the histogram plot here at the very end. I'm going to turn my phone sideways. So we can use this page for a lot more than sector times. But for now, we'll, we'll focus on sector times. You can use this page to look at uh, average speed, maximum speed, minimum speed um, throughout the session, right? So actually, let me cover that real quick because I don't think we talk about it a lot. But I want to see what my average speed is on each lap. Speed, mean, right? Mean, median, mode, high school. I barely remember that stuff. I was stuck in a mud pit in my Jeep somewhere, probably during geometry or uh, whatever class that was in history. I don't, I don't even know. Um, I'm just kidding. So average speed throughout the lap. So my average speed here was 70.3. My fastest or my faster lap here was 77 mile per hour average speed, right? This was a new car. This is a little bit, you know, larger spread than you would normally see. Um, if you want to look at, you know, your maximum speed on each lap, then go to max. And you can do the same thing with every metric. You can do the same thing with um, G-forces. You can do the same thing with 
whatever you, you can find on that left-hand slider. Um, so a lot of people want to know what was my top speed. Maybe that's an important metric in a certain part of the track. What was my slowest speed? Maybe that's an important metric. Instead of having to go sift through the speed traces on different laps and figure that out, come to this grand page, speed, min, max, done. All right, nice and easy. Very cool. So sector times at the top. A couple important things. Um, you're not going to get this page if you have two laps overlaid. Uh, if you have two laps overlaid, this page is not going to be available. So you've got to look at this with only one lap selected. The reason is because we're looking at all the laps right here. All right, we've already got all the laps. Um, yes, you'll be able to do more with overlaying laps and looking at sectors, specific data points with sectors in the future. Um, so what we're looking at here, and this interface is going to change, improve, get better, um, whatever you want to call it, but this is what we're working with currently. Um, you're going to see sector one at the bottom and the last sector, meaning when you cross the start finish line at the end of the lap is at the top. So this is our first sector, second sector, third sector, fourth, fifth, sixth lap time. First sector, second sector, you get the idea. Color coding, red means your worst sector, green means your best sector. These blue alternating colors are just so that you can tell that there's a different sector there, right? It just kind of distinguishes them. You can see on this particular session, this lap right here had all of my best sectors. All right, I think I mentioned this was a, I was driving a customer's car for coaching. And when I drive a new car, um, I'll share this because it might be relevant for you if you're driving multiple cars. Maybe you have a race car, maybe you have a track car, maybe you share a race car. Um, when you get in a new car, a lot of times, for me, I take about three laps and I'm just feeling out, making sure the brake pedal works the way I think it does, using the steering kind of to feel what the car feels like, getting a sense for it. And then the third, third fourth lap, I start to turn the width up a little bit. So you'll see that in the sector times. Um, so you can see that here. Obviously, I got comfortable with the car on this lap and then boom, I went almost a second quicker here. Um, and that's why all my fastest sectors are here. If I were to go look at a session with a car that I know really well and I've driven a bunch, that I'm not just learning for the first time, you're more likely to see those sectors spread out, those best sectors, those green sectors spread out throughout the session. Um, and that's when sectors get really, really valuable. Um, here in particular, I wouldn't really glean a whole lot of information from this because you can tell the only place, you know, I had a two tenths better sector here. So obviously I'd want to investigate why that was the case, but I know for a fact that I probably could have done a better lap in general, right, overall, because it's the first time in the car. Um, so when you're looking through your sectors, it's important to consider all that stuff. Sometimes I like to make notes while I'm doing it as well. Um, that goes with any data system, as does most of this. Our optimal lap is going to be the top of the column that's all green sectors. So that's all of our best sectors added up, which obviously is going to be a slower time. I'm mean, sorry, a faster time, a lower number, a faster time than our best lap. Uh, general rule of thumb, it's, it's a little different depending on how you define your sectors, how consistent of a driver you are. Um, but usually you can get, you know, if you're in a car you know really well, on the track you know well, your optimal hopefully is about a second better than your best. You can usually get about half of that optimal pretty realistically, right, in similar conditions. Um, so that optimal is kind of a carrot to chase. It's not to say, hey, this is actually possible. Hopefully you set your sectors in a way that it is. Um, Baker, do we have any specific to sector time questions? Awesome. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to video since I think we've beat sector times a little bit. This is the, um, the crux of the functionality with sectors as well here. The most important things to know are green is your best, red are the ones you don't need to worry about. Um, we talked about how to define the certain areas. What you wanna do is let's say sector three is an important place you wanna focus on, sector one, two, three, right? This would be the row that I would be looking at that's important. When I do a lap well, that's lap five, go look at sector three on lap five. Right, go see what the speed trace looks like, go see what um, the apex lights are doing. Are there still red lights there? Whoops, I just moved the camera, Baker. Let me out here. Uh, I think I got it. Um, that's about all there is to sectors. Let's go ahead and look at video. There's no questions on sectors. So I mentioned there's been some changes with video. I'm gonna go ahead and connect to the Apex Pro unit. We've got one right here. I'm gonna, we're all familiar with this. I'm not gonna remember it because this is not mine. This is ready for sale. 
go ahead and calibrate it. All right. Actually, I'm sorry. Let me pick a track real quick. Chasing the dragon. Cool. So you'll notice a couple of new things on this page. Um, this is all really important when we're talking about uh, setting up our video and setting up recording. This page, this is my phone that's being airplayed to the computer. If I orient it in landscape, it no longer orients automatically. It used to be able to rotate it and it would rotate the screen, right? No longer does that. That is because uh, it's going to try to rotate for you on the track on occasion. Um, and this is something that we really, uh, we noticed personally recently, but also have heard, you know, for a while and finally decided that we need to, it's significant enough that we need to do something about it. If you're in a really high grip car, um, you know, I was driving a car with 100 trouble tires, aero, but a lot of grip. And uh, we were doing, you know, almost 1.5 G um, and on a really bumpy track at NOAA. Well, those bumps and the G's together would sometimes be enough that it would convince the phone that it needs to move to landscape. So I would be recording in, uh, in landscape and it would try to move to portrait or I'd be looking at my lap list in portrait and it would try to move to landscape. So to fix that, there's now just this rotation button at the bottom, which will orient it to portrait or landscape, no matter how your phone is actually oriented. Right now my phone is like this, right? It's not gonna change. But if I tap this, then it's gonna orient. I think that's a big improvement. It's a lot more robust. It's a lot more uh, practical for how we actually use this in a race car and in a you know racing environment. Um, it does mean that there's one more, you know, you've got to wait to put your gloves on for another few seconds if you need to orient the screen. Um, if you don't have the touch sensing gloves or um, or whatever, or you can just orient it the way you want it before you mount your phone. And we're assuming we're recording video here. Before we go into recording, remember when you orient it in landscape, that's where you have the option to select predictive or predictive delta. So the wand is predictive lap timing. The wand with the triangle is predictive delta. Uh, we went uh, through those extensively on the last webinar. I've got a whole video that explains, you know, first of all, what is predictive lap timing? How is it calculated? And then how do you use it? Uh, and same with predictive delta. So we're not gonna go into detail on those. I think most of us get that uh, for the most part at this point, um, but it is a really interesting video. If you don't know how it's calculated, I would urge you to know, just like anything in the data world, you wanna know how the measurements are gathered for it to be really valuable for you. Um, I, I guarantee you, you'll get something out, out of those videos and you'll go, hey, I didn't know that. And I'm, I think about predictive a little differently now. Um, so that's really cool. Uh, once you purchase Lap Timer Plus, this icon will no longer be gray, it's now blue. That means I can open it and I can start recording video. So hopefully most of you have tried this at this point. I'm just gonna video my keyboard here to show you the options. Video, we highly, highly recommend um, that we do uh, video recording um, in, I'm sorry, make sure I get all this stuff. I uh, highly recommend that we do video recording in portrait mode. I'm sorry, in landscape, don't listen to me. I'm doing too many things at once. All right, so I highly recommend that you record video in, lands in the landscape orientation. Um, now to do that, see how this funky thing just happened where the screen changed? To do that, we need to have the proper orientation selected on this page first. So go right here and then press video. If you wanna record in portrait, start from here. If you want to record in landscape, start from here. That's a, that's a change. We need to know that. If you start recording in portrait and you orient the phone, it's going to end up recording the video the wrong way, right? So make sure that if you're going to, if you want to capture video in landscape, make sure your phone, you tap the little rotation button and it's in landscape. And you're good to go. All right, I'm going to tap the video button again. Now I'm in landscape. All right, that's pretty self-explanatory. Mount your phone, you can get an idea of the picture. Look at Big Bird there, see what he's doing. All right. Now there's a couple of options on this page. These are, this is another change. This is a particular place to pay attention. This stabilization option here, we changed fundamentally what these options do. 
Um, so they still look the same. I'm sorry. They still look the same and they still say the same thing, but they actually mean something different now. Uh, so to change uh, between natural and stabilized, stabilization is more meaningful now. Basically, Apple gives you, let's say, six different options from no stabilization at all, just recording with the camera, no software stabilization, all the way to cinematic stabilization or whatever they call it, dramatic stabilization. Previously, we were using the two middle options. So kind of a mild stabilization and a little more stabilization. Now we're using no stabilization for natural, zero, to and cinematic stabilization for stabilized. Uh, after doing some research, hearing enough from other people, watching a bunch of other videos, took a couple of months to gather enough information, we determined that that was the way to go. The video that I've seen so far is extremely promising. So if you have not recorded video, try it on natural and stabilized, render the video and see what you like better because um, they both look better than the previous options. Um, so I would definitely give those a shot. That's not going to fix um, the problem permanently. You're still gonna have to make sure your mount is as rigid as possible. Uh, you're still gonna have some vibration that's just inherent because this is not an action cam that's designed for those high frequency vibrations. Um, two things on iOS hardware that's important to know, the newer iOS devices, everything iPhone 7 to iPhone uh, 11, has a software stabilization. So it's actually like a post-processed stabilization in the camera. So the camera records it and then there's software that corrects for the stabilization. Both the iPhones, the iPhone 6S, 6S, older iPhone, it's actually the oldest iPhone you can get that will run iOS 14, has mechanical stabilization. So that stabilization actually is using a lens to stabilize the video it films exceptionally good video. If you have a 6S, the, uh, the resolution is not necessarily as good as a, as a 10 or 11, iPhone 10 or 11, but it's very, very good stabilization. The video is not shaky. It'll account for the shakiness in the mount. It's really good. The software stabilization is simply not as good for race cars. Um, but with this new change that we made, it's much better. Um, the iPhone 12 is incrementally better than what exists now. It's, it's still software stabilization, but it's better. Cool, stabilization, got that out of the way. Uh, if you don't wanna record video, you need to select disable. That is just gonna not record any video, right? If you do wanna record video, toggle over to record. Mm -hmm. All right, don't forget to press save either at the bottom. Uh, and then lastly, our final option down here is the 720 and 1080p option. Um, so that's just your resolution. Right, that's 720 resolution, 1080p resolution. Um, the main talking point there is the higher the resolution, 1080p is going to take longer to render. So it might take as long as the video um, is that you recorded. So like a 20 minute HPD session is going to take almost 20 minutes to, re to render in 1080p, whereas 720p is going to cut down on the rendering time. So if you're like, hey, I want my video, um, you know, I want to see how close I was getting to the edge of the track. I want the video for learning purposes. 720p is the way to go. If you're going to be sharing it on YouTube, sending it to friends and family, you're not concerned about how long it takes, I would render it in 1080p. Um, those are some options that you have. But you need to think about those before you record it, because obviously you can't change that once it's, once it's recorded. It's going to tell you how long, uh, how much storage space you have. I'm sorry, so how many minutes of video you can render. Um, it's important to clear out your camera roll. If you're, uh, you've had your phone for a long time and it's not a high storage phone, clear out your camera roll. Um, pictures are really small, but videos take up a lot of space. So just you know, go into your photo album, categorize it by videos and just start deleting old videos that you don't care about, move them to your iCloud drive, whatever you gotta do. That's gonna help um, rendering time in storage space, how many videos you can store. The last thing I'll say on rendering, and we'll touch on, on this again, is it requires a ton of RAM to render the video. It needs a lot of RAM. Your phone is using RAM every time you open up an app, right? Just like a computer opening up a program, right? Opening up a desktop icon or a browser. Close out all the other apps when you're rendering, and that's gonna make it go a lot more smoothly, a lot faster. Um, you'll notice that the video is at 30 FPS. That's pretty standard. Um, 30 frames per second. Um, that's a that's a pretty high frame rate. It's not you know your 60 that you'll get with uh, super high resolution uh, cameras and that sort of thing. But it's but it's really good. 
Uh, again, we actually can change that and make it better, but some iPhones are only going to render maximum 30 FPS. Um, there's not really a huge benefit to improving the frame rate because it actually would probably make it shakier. I'm going to tap save, and you'll notice now once once I tap save, and I go back to the um, the main page, which the uh, presentation here is lagging behind. You can see what's on my phone; it's not on the screen. But once it goes back, you're going to see the app icon, or the I'm sorry, the video icon will no longer have a cross through it. So the way you tell if you're recording video or not is if the video has, oh man, we're way behind. If the little icon has a slash through it or, uh, or if it does not. If it has a slash through it, it's disabled. If not, it's recording. Um, I'm gonna stop the share real quick and take a look at questions because the, the lag is getting pretty considerable there. Um, let's go through the uh, Q&A real quick and then I'll share the screen and we'll talk about rendering and then Lifetimer Plus specific data channels uh, to, to finish everything out. Doug said, now that we have phone videos, there are external action camera integration on the roadmap. Well, of course there is. Uh, that's been in the plan from the beginning, but it's not gonna be anytime soon, so um, don't, uh, don't get too excited about it. That's a very, very long-term project. Um, we've got a couple of smart folks working on it, and um, believe it or not, it's not easy to make it plug and play and simple, which is the goal. It's extremely difficult so far. Um, we've learned from others, and we've done some research, and, and some stuff ourselves, but yes, we're absolutely working on that. Uh, Greg says, OBD2 interface, I want to buy, but why do I want it? <laughs> Help. Um, Greg, I'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about LTP specific channels, so I'll hold off on that. Um, the OBD2 interface is, you know, plugs into the car's OBD2 port and it's going to collect data um, from the vehicle. Um, Greg, the important thing to know about OBD2 is um, that it's, it's going to get only OBD2 standardized channels, which is different than what's on your vehicle's CAN bus. The CAN bus is kind of like the, the memory bank that all of the modern cars all have a CAN bus, and that's where all of kind of the central collection, you know, someone can correct me because my understanding of it's different than reality, I'm sure, but um, that's where all the data is going to, to gather, and you can, you can access that, but it's expensive to access it. Uh, it's hard to tap into it. I'll, I'll say basically look up OBD2 standard channels and you'll, you'll get all of that information logged to your phone from the Apex Pro OBD2 device. So if you need to know coolant temperature, throttle position, very important for driving, pedal position, also very important for driving. We'll talk about that. You can do a gear ratio calculation in the app. Very simple, very cool. We'll talk about that more. Um, back in the day, Richard Soul, back in the day, I had to find sectors, boundaries at the entrance and exit of corners. This had a side effect of turning each straight into a sector. This allowed me to fine tune everything very well. Thanks, Richard. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, that's a fantastic example. So he's saying he defined every sector uh, on the entry and the exit of the corner. That's really up to, you know, individuals, right? If it's a long braking zone, defining a sector in the middle of the braking zone, not a bad thing. I just shared kind of my you know, theory behind what I do to find the sectors. Um, Richard continues and says, one reason it works so well is that you can look at each sector and see, oh, I exited this corner at two miles per hour faster than before. And then you can see the difference in the next sector, which is effectively a straight. Yeah, I like that. I like looking at sectors and, and it helps you define, okay, this sector time was slower than it should be, right? Slower than my best. Why was it slower? Uh, and that's what the speed element is because I was two miles per hour slower at the apex, right? Or maybe I braked earlier, whatever it is. Kathy says, it will not let me select mean. Well, that's awfully mean. Um, Baker, try to select mean on the app, on the histogram page, if you don't mind. Or any of them on that screen. Never mind. Never mind, Baker. We're all set. Um, all right, so we got the questions answered so far. Greg, I'll drill into yours a little bit more here in a second. Um, just give me a second to pull my screen back up. I stopped the sharing because the lag was, was getting pretty bad. Um, it's using Wi-Fi to connect uh, to, the, uh, to the Zoom uh, stream here. We're also streaming this live on Facebook, so there's quite a lot of uh, bandwidth being used. So let's talk about rendering, how to render video. Uh, real quick. 
and then we will talk about the channels that you get, the data channels, additional data channels that you're going to get with Platinum Plus. All right, so we're back on the home screen of the app. Back on the home screen to get to video rendering. So we were just on the drive screen. We recorded video. We were at the track. We pressed save. Yeah, video recorded, video saved. Cool. Where do we go to access it? So there's a couple of ways to do it. If you don't want to go through the app at all, you can go to your camera roll and it'll be the most recent thing on your camera roll in your phone, right? Just your regular old camera roll. It'll be like you recorded a video or you can access it through the app. So we're going to go to data, which is right here in the middle. And then you're going to notice that the sessions you record with video are going to have the video icon here on the right side. Yeah, there's Bobby, who's on the, uh, on the webinar right now. Video, video. So you're going to look for the, uh, the sessions that have a little video icon affiliated with them. Okay. I'm going to go to a session that I know I have the video on my phone for that session. Sorry. All right. So now we're looking at um, data. We see the little video icon. I want to render my video. We're going to click the icon here. So just tap it. And that's going to open up this interface. It's going to give you a preview of the video. So the very first, you know, screen, the very first thing that the camera saw, and then it's going to show you what all is going to be displayed. So you're going to see your vehicle, your name, track, the Apex Pro, lap number, lap time. This is the Apex Pro light display, track map with instantaneous speed, how fast you were going. If you don't want to see all that stuff, if you're like, hey, I just want to see lap time, or I just want to see the track map, you can tap those. See how when I tap it, it says no Apex Pro, right? It's a little long. No map. No speed. Shutting those things off is going to make um, it's going to make those rendering faster. Um, Baker, you, are you looking at uh, Q and A? Bill says your contact link on the website is broken. How can we contact somebody most easily for your team? Bill, the easiest way to do it now is to ask us your question here if you'd like. Um, we just changed the website over to a new server this morning, so we'll we will look into that. Um, you also have some options down here. So shutting off these guys right here is going to make rendering time faster, but it's not going to give you that information. So if you really want to see, you know, did I have red lights in the corners, you're going to want to have this turned on, right? In my opinion, the video and the apex light overlay is, is one of the simplest ways to review data, right? Go through there, see how many red lights were just playing through the corner and go, man, I had a lot more to give right there. What did I do? What can I do differently? Right? Can I roll more speed? Can I get on the throttle sooner? So on and so forth. Um, obviously, the map is cool. Uh, it shows you where you are on the track. That's very helpful. And then speed is obviously also very important. Um, I'll go ahead and answer it now. Yes, there'll be more options in the future to display on this screen so that you don't have to go, you know, if you want your throttle position or your G-forces overlaid, you don't have to go somewhere else. We're going to do that in the future. But again, one thing at a time. Big updates uh, mean big crashes. <laughs> and we're not about that. Um, to actually render the video, just tap the render button. Make sure all your other apps are closed out, right? Close them all out. Tap render, and then that's going to show you how much time is remaining. It's going to show you percentage of rendering, and you need to leave your phone open while it renders. You can't close it. As soon as you black out the screen or put the phone to sleep, the uh, anything, this is for any app, just technology point on, uh, on iPhones, the, um, the apps lose the ability to, to control what's happening with the phone, right? You have to have the screen open and unlocked. They can't really make decisions in the background. Play raw video is just show the video raw. And then export is basically turning it into an exportable file that you can send wherever you want. Once you render it, it's going to save the rendering to your camera roll, just like the raw video. And then you can do whatever you want with that video. So if you're trying to send a data session with a video file that you've already rendered to another device. You can't just send the data file and then render the video on that device. If you want to see that video on that other device, just send it like you would as an email or airdrop it or Dropbox or whatever from your camera roll. 
Does that make sense? I've had customers reach out about that and say, hey, I sent my data, uh, but I can't render the video on my iPad. I recorded the video on my iPhone, sent the session to my iPad, now I can't render it. Well, that's because the recording is still on your iPhone. So if you press render, there's no video for it to access in the camera roll on the iPad. That's done locally. Um, there's no reason if you've already rendered it to send the raw video over and then render it again. Just email yourself the rendered video. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, Greg, will the phone record OBD2 data? Does that mean, so you need, a, you need an actual device. I don't have one in here. It's a little dongle, but it's a Bluetooth plug for the OBD2 that plugs into your OBD2 unit. That little device, just like the Apex Pro, just like this sends data to your phone, it sends that data via Bluetooth to your phone. So no, your phone does not record the data. It's saved on your phone, but the data is actually being logged and being transmitted by the little OBD2 dongle. So you actually need the hardware uh, in order to do that. Um, looks like this, it's like a little little guy. You've probably used it if you've ever run diagnostics on your car before. You can actually use this one to do check engine lights and, and check codes and stuff like that. Uh, last thing down here, just kind of some window dressing. Um, got white, black, white, black, black, white. When you select these, that's going to change the color of the uh, text. So you can actually select like all black text, all white text, all black, white and black, black and white. That changes the color of the text up here and the text down here. So maybe you recorded on like a particularly low light day where you want white text up here. Most of the time you're, you're probably gonna want to see black text up there um, for visibility. That's important to know as well. Cool. All right, last thing let's touch on is Laptimer Plus specific channels. So when you buy Laptimer Plus, you get access to some additional uh, channels, basically custom channels that you don't have access for with the main app, with the regular app. Uh, and those are, in my opinion, all three of them are extremely helpful. So let's take a look at what those are. I'll go into this same session from NOLA. Actually, I'm not going to use NOLA because they're, they're altitude related and um, track, you know, uh, elevation change related. So let's do another barber session because that's going to be more interesting. NOLA is very flat, it doesn't change a whole lot. Okay, so we're gonna start on this page with the GPS map, and you can follow along if you haven't seen these before. So there's three channels that we're gonna get unlocked with, uh, with Laptimer Plus. The first thing we're gonna do before we actually go look at them down here is open up the little wrench. That is the sector, or I'm sorry, not the sector, this is like the data channel editing interface. So you can actually move your data channels around depending on how often you use them or what you use. Uh, but now you can see whether a channel is free, whether it requires laps overlaid, whether it requires OBD2. This is a really cool tool to use right here. So looking at the top to the bottom, speed is my first channel that I have up here, then gain loss, then apex score. If you wanna move those around, like sometimes I use apex score at the top. Um, you can just press the little hamburger guy right there and go. That's just for organizational purposes, makes it easier to use if, if you have them where you want. Little triangle, delta, that means you need two laps overlaid to see that channel, otherwise it's gonna be red. So gain loss obviously is the difference uh, in time between two laps. You need two laps overlaid to see that. That's all that's telling you. This little uh, tack right here, little tack gauge, the little RPM sweep, um, that is going to indicate that you need the OBD2 device. So Greg, if you're watching um, right now, tap the little wrench icon. All the channels that you see here with the uh, TAC icon, the little motor, whatever you want to call it, little gauge icon, that indicates that you need the OBD2 dongle to display those, to see log data for those. So RPM, gear calculation, um, MAP, which is your, um, your uh, manifold air pressure, um, coolant temperature, throttle position, TPS, all those you're going to need, uh, they would be two. The blue ribbon is Laptimer Plus required. So for gear position, you need both OBD2 and Laptimer Plus for the gear calculation, primarily because that was extremely difficult to, to build in the app and high cost, um, but also because uh, it's a pretty premium feature. It's pretty, um, 
it's kind of like doing the sector interface. You kind of have to know what you're doing. Um, and if you want to reach out to me, Greg, if that's something you're interested in or anyone else, um, I can walk you through that. We've got a video on it that I can send you as well. Um, but it basically allows you to go in and create a channel that just shows you your gear. So you can go tap the lab and go, oh, it's in fourth gear. Super, super high value. Um, the other channels that I mentioned, um, I mentioned some other ones. I said three in particular that I'm going to talk about are altitude, pedal, pedal percentage, and grade. Grade. Also, sector is a is a, a channel for um, left turn plus as well. But let's talk about altitude and grade real quick. Those are GPS computed. So if you're looking for altitude, that is uh, computed by the GPS that's in the car. So it's it's essentially looking at you know the the delta in your in your altitude change. Someone might know more about GPS and know how they actually calculate that, and might be cross referencing the coordinates with known elevation. I'm not exactly sure, but what it's going to show you is a graph of the elevation over sea level, uh, or in case of NOLA, actually elevation below sea level, which is really interesting because it is below sea level, um, and that is in meters. So when you select the altitude channel you will see altitude over sea level in meters. If it's negative, you're underwater or in NOLA. Grade is in degrees. So grade is degrees of incline. Negative is going to be downhill, positive is uphill. Grade is probably one of the most single most beneficial channels that you can look at. Um, note that since these are both GPS calculated, it's also going to depend on how fast you are going so like on a slow, slow, slow lap, like an out lap in cold weather or something, the grade's gonna be slightly less dramatic than when you're going fast. So you really wanna look at grade from one of your fast laps, which is gonna show kind of an accurate depiction of the grade change uh, on the track. So I'll show you what those look like. Um, the last thing here I was gonna talk about is pedal percentage. The reason pedal percentage is important or is cool is because that is the throttle pedal movement. So that requires a newer car with a drive-by-wire throttle um, that's going to, you know, send the pedal input as a part of, uh, you know, the OBD2 standard. So usually something newer than 2008. If you want that, you might need to research, does my car actually send pedal percentage to OBD2? Just look up, does car XYZ have pedal percentage? Uh, and, and you'll find it online. Um, but what's cool about that is that throttle position, TPS, which is very, very commonly used as a driver metric is measuring the throttle plate and the throttle body right which if you think about how traction control works or how stability control works it is using that it's manipulating that throttle plate right so if you're a wide open throttle and traction control cuts in what's going to happen to the throttle plate's going to be flat wide open and it's going to start closing right it's going to so you're going to see some noise in that channel that might not be correlated with what you're doing apex pro is all about driver inputs and figuring out what I can do to improve, right? Because I'm the biggest variable in the car, right? You know, until you get to the F1 level, it's the driver's the, the, the biggest vari variable. And even then, it's still the biggest variable, but the car matters a little more. Different conversation, kind of philosophical. Won't talk about that now. Pedal percentage is cool because it's purely what your foot is doing to the, to the pedal, right? And that's throttle pedal. You do not get brake input or steering input with OBD2. Nobody does. It's not a government um, agreed upon standard channel that you have to transmit over OBD2. You're gonna need something more expensive and more complicated to get that information. Um, and frankly, depending on where you are in your level of, of data investment, you probably don't need it. It's great to have, probably don't need it. Um, long G, just flip it upside down and it's kind of, kind of looks like brake pressure trace to be quite honest. Um, I have lots of opinions on that as well. Um, Feel free to talk to me offline about that. Let's look at what these graphs look like really quickly, or what they look like when you overlay these on the track. So if I go to grade and I overlay grade on the map of Barber, red is going to be negative grade, so driving downhill. Green is gonna be positive grade. So I would urge you right now, since all of your Lifetime Plus subscribers, pull up some data from your home track, go to grade and just look at it colored over this map and start to think about what that means it's super powerful. This is something that will give you a competitive advantage that will make you a better driver. It's, it's everything, right? This is a big deal. 
So I'm looking here, like, look, this is kind of orange, means it's negative, so it's downhill. This is downhill all the way to the apex here, right? So the car's kind of fallen, fallen away from you. You gotta respect that, right? This is really uphill right here, right? I'm starting to turn, it's uphill, and then it changes right here, right? This is really downhill. This is really downhill. This is powerful stuff. This is really powerful. What's even more powerful in my opinion is when we move to the next page and we look at grade on a graph. Let me color it blue. All right. I won't spend a ton of time on this because we're about at the end here, but this is what Barber Motorsports Park looks like if you were to take the track, straighten it out, believe the elevation, and then cut it in half. All right, just imagine that. Imagine taking a string and having it precisely change grade by how much the track changes, right? That's what this would look like. Um, so what you're seeing here is anytime you see this valley in the grade, that's going to be what? Compression. That's going to be the track going down and then up, especially when it's a really steep peak, right? This is less dramatic. So anytime you see that V in the grade channel, that is a place where you can take advantage of the terrain. You can carry more speed into that corner or into that part of the track, wherever it is, right? Especially if it's at the apex of the corner, you can really send the car in there with more speed and allow the track to kind of catch you. Um, obviously don't go out and try that and say, Andrew told me to try that, right? Think about it. But if you move the little slider to where those changes in grade are, you can see represented by the blue dot on the track where that is. Right, so when now I'm seeing the crosshairs right here, that's the apex of turn one. Great change, right? That's powerful. This one's more subtle, but I got a big one right here. There's a valley right there, right? Do this on your home track. Do this on the track you know the best and cross-reference it with what you think the grade change is, right? You might have walked the track, so you might know really well. Right, you might be like, oh man, I walked Road Atlanta and at the base of turn five, you know, or going up into turn five, I'm like looking up at the, at the skyscraper, right? Or, yeah, I've been to middle Ohio and, you know, if you go stand down in China Beach, right, going up into Madness is really steep, whatever. Um, Laguna Seca, hey, I've, I've been standing in the corkscrew, right? The grade change there is insane. Cross reference what you think about it with what the grade channel says because it will, I guarantee you, it will add something to your game. Um, you can also pull this up if you have an iPad in particular, pull up the GPS screen on top, this screen on the bottom, go to all those points of grade change and look at how many red Apex Pro lights are displayed. Because a lot of times we as drivers, and I know this in particular, like turn 12, 13 at Barber, some other places, I don't carry as much speed as the car and the tire will accept because I just don't trust that the grip's there in the track. But there's extra grip because there's a change in grade. So if I see a couple of red lights there, I know I can, I can be confident that I can carry more speed through there or I can enter the corner differently. Um, altitude looks a little different. Let's look at altitude real quick. So remember altitude is now um, elevation over sea level, right? So grade is the change in altitude. Altitude is an absolute number, right? Altitude is we're 150 yards above sea level or 150 meters above sea level right here. Right. So this is where you can get an idea of, uh, you know, how just how tall, right, how big of a hill you're climbing. Grade's going to tell you um, how steep it is. Altitude's going to tell you how tall it is, right, or how steep it goes downhill. So this is useful to find, hey, where's the lowest point on the track, right? Lowest elevation on the track. Where's the highest point on the track? Um, what's the general trend? Is this all generally going uphill with some changes in grade? Is this all generally going downhill with some changes in grade? Not quite as influential on how you drive the track, but very good information to know and to have um, when you're learning a track really well. I particularly use these two channels, altitude and grade, when I'm going to a new track. Um, if I can get some data for a track I haven't been to, and I can look at these, like I'm going to Coda this weekend to coach some drivers um, in WRL, in the WRL endurance race. And so what I've done already is I've gone and looked at both of these channels to familiarize, really re-familiarize myself. It's been a few years since I've been there with where the elevation changes on the track, how significant that elevation changes, the steepness of it with grade, um, just so that I'm 
intimately familiar with the track surface when I get there. The thing that this isn't going to define is the cambering or the tilting the banking of the track, right? This is the uh, change in altitude. I'm sorry, this is the altitude or the change in slope, greatest change in slope for where you drove the car on the track. So for the driving line that you chose. It's not the whole width of the track, right? It's only using what is reported by this. So take that for what it is. Uh, try a different line. If you're changing something dramatically, like, you know, some corners, whatever, I, I'm not getting quite the apex. I think it's faster or I don't track out all the way for whatever reason, X, Y, Z. Track what laps you do that, right? Find it on the track map. Didn't track out as much this lap, whatever. And then go, go compare the grade change and see if there's a significant difference between the two lines, right? All else the same. Um, that's really helpful. Uh, I hope that information has been helpful. Um, I didn't look at a pedal position graph. I have to dig a little deeper in the data to find one. It looks like throttle position, but it's you're, it doesn't have traction control intervention and other other things that influence that. Um, I think that is it. Uh, we've recorded this entire webinar. Let me go through the Q and A's real quick and just make sure. Um, Greg, I think we got your OBD2 questions answered. Feel free to reach out. Um, apex at apextrackcoach.com. That comes to myself, Baker, Ross, Lisa, the whole team gets it. Um, uh, Bill, looking to have a guest on our podcast to talk about Apex Pro. Not the most technical question for this forum, but I've been chasing you for a few months. Uh, I'm always in, love doing podcasts. Um, Bill, can you email me at uh, apex at apextrackcoach.com? Um, I would love to do that. Uh, I don't know if I have your contact. I'm sure I do. I just have to look through my list. But um, Richard says, so do you have to turn off the screen, screen saver idle time setting during rendering? Uh, no, Richard, it will, the app knows that when you're rendering, it can't close the screen. So if you just leave your phone, if, as long as you don't hit the button to kill the screen, you know, like if I just leave it on whatever it was on, as long as I don't do that, then I'm good. So just leave your screen on. You'll be set. Brett says, got it. Is there a way to connect to an OBD1, connect the OBD2 to a Megasquid? Uh, Ken, you said OBD1 in your question. Um, if your Megasquid is an OBD1, then the answer is definitely no. Uh, the answer, if you have OBD2, is is there an OBD2 port on the Megasquid? And if there is, you can try it. I'm not sure that it will work, um, but you can try it. I feel like I've been asked that question before. I don't remember the exact answer. Uh, Robert says, some manufacturers put brake pressure on OBD2. My Solo can pick it up for the Porsche GTS. That is true, Robert. What's confusing and very difficult, and I'm pretty, I'm 99.9% .9 sure someone may know more about this than I do. You can access the CAN bus through OBD2. So you can plug into your OBD2 port and get brake pressure. The reason you can't get it with our OBD2 device is because this is not a CAN bus device. So CAN bus and OBD2 are two separate things, but they connect to the same. You can connect to the CAN bus through the OBD2 port. It uses different pins on the connector and different logic to get to that part of the brain of the car. So our device cannot get brake pressure. Other devices can. The Solo 2 has CAN protocols. The Solo, the AM Solo 2 DL has CAN protocols where you can have somebody preset it so that it will communicate with your car. Um, the reason they do that is because they've spent a lot of time, a lot of time developing those protocols and learning how to communicate with those cars. Yes, it's something we can do. I don't think we're going to because I, I simply don't think that there's an easy enough, low cost enough way to do it um, that works well. But yes, you're not incorrect. You can absolutely access CAN data through the OBD2 port. If I'm completely wrong and OBD2, that channel is on OBD2, then I'll admit that I'm wrong, but I don't think it is because I do a lot of research on OBD2 and as of a couple of months ago, brake pressure is not a required OBD2 channel. So OBD2 is a, is a standardization that all manufacturers agree to. So they all say, 
any basic OBD2 device can access this information on the OBD2 port. CAN bus is specific to that manufacturer, sometimes to that vehicle, sometimes to that year model. Um, OBD2 is sometimes specific as well. But what's important to think about here is that CAN can change from model to model. It can change from trim level to trim level. Uh, like a Porsche, you know, Cayman GTS might be different from a GT4. That's, that's how CAN works. It's a, it's, it's a totally different, um, totally different thing than OBD2, but it's extremely similar. Um, it's extremely similar in that it connects through the same, you can connect through the same port. You can also get to the CAN bus that works. Awesome. All right, guys, uh, the last thing I'll tie up with is just um, you know, a big thank you to everybody who's participated. Um, we've gotten a lot of feedback uh, from emails um, and uh, comments in the Lifetimer Plus group. When you're using a feature or um, there's something you like or don't like, particularly if you like it, uh, also if you don't like it, you know, something you're using in the app, leave us a comment on the Lifetimer Plus uh, subscriber group. I check it daily just to make sure, um, see what the conversation is. Um, so uh, don't hesitate to do that. You can reach out to us at apex at apextrackcoach.com to submit your feedback, ask questions. Um, the last thing I'll end with is uh, just kind of an update on the business. Apex Pro's um, done really well in 2020 and, and grown in a lot of ways. Obviously, Laptimer Plus is new. We've got a lot of big plans um, for the Laptimer Plus subscription for adding more value to that. Um, and then over the next 12 months, uh, obviously you've noticed some app updates we've done recently. Um, we've recently developed some processes to build updates more reliably in the app. So I think you'll see that. I think you'll see uh, uh, continuously more reliable uh, features and, and stuff like that in the app. Um, I've been doing a lot of private coaching recently. So um, Apex Pro users like yourself have reached out and said, hey, Andrew, I want you to work with me specifically for a weekend at the track. Um, so I've been doing a good bit of that. I've actually almost got all the bookings I can take for 2021. I think I've got seven weekends booked and I'm, and I'm looking to do more, no more than like 12 or 15 at the most. 12 is probably a good number. If you think you might be interested in private coaching, send me an email, um, same email, apex at apextrackcoach.com just so the rest of our team sees it. Some of you send, um, have my personal email address, that's fine if we have a conversation going, but um, if you wanna make sure we get back to you, it really helps to send it to Apex. Um, but if you want to book for a private coaching date, go ahead and reach out and let's already talk about dates because I've already got, like I said, seven weekends committed. I'm in a wedding. Um, you know, more of my friends are getting engaged and putting their weddings off. So those are things that I can't move on my schedule. So the earlier you can get to me and say, hey, I'm doing an event at this track on this date. Um, I know some schedules aren't out yet, but the sooner you can request that, um, the better. I'm happy to include details about what that program looks like. Um, it's $1,500 a day uh, to get me to the track plus expenses for wherever that's traveled, um, travel to. Um, that's a competitive rate with other, with other high-end coaches. Um, but I'm happy to talk to you about what that, that process looks like. Uh, in the same vein, we also do remote data reviews. So if you're watching this and you're going, this is great. I know how to use the features, but I want feedback on what my data looks like and how to make it look better and how I can do better with that. Send us an email to Apex at Apex Track Coach and we can talk about um, about what that looks like. Sometimes it's best to just hop on the phone because um, I've had customers that have booked five data review sessions, right? And they're um, you know, around $200 a session, so we do a discount for a volume, right? Um, so that's a really cost-effective way to get coaching. Um, so just a plug for those, uh, those services that we offer, usually those are where we see the biggest improvements, right? Many of you on here have either spend time with me personally at the track or um, have been, you know, one of our classrooms and been exposed to some of the teaching methodology and stuff that we, uh, that we preach and that we do. So I um, appreciate you for, for following along with everything. Uh, Kathy, uh, question, when I review TPS and pedal, it shows 55 to 60% as the max. Is there an offset depending on cars? Yeah, the max is going to be different depending on the car, uh, Kathy. And I, I don't know, most cars I see like a max between 75 and 85 percent. That's all the way open. Um, that's just how it reads. Um, some cars it might be less, but as long as you're seeing a flat line on, if you go to the graph page, it should like TPS should go up and then it should flat line while you're wide open throttle. If it doesn't do that, something might be up, but if it does, the number is less important than the fact that it's your wide open throttle. 
All right, I think we had all the questions answered. Again, feel free to reach out to us, apex to apex uh, Subscribe to the Apex Pro uh, Lap Timer Plus group uh, and the Apex Pro Users group for that matter as well. Um, I'm sure if there's something that I forgot, Baker will remind me when we're done and you know, won't be able to say it anyway. Is he paying attention? Did I forget anything, Baker? Yeah. All right. Okay, everybody, have a fantastic Tuesday. You'll see a follow-up email from us with a link to watch this again so you can hear me ramble on for another hour uh, and then um, some other resources. I'm going to send some videos and stuff. Um, watch the uh, Lap Timer Plus subscriber page. We're going to go ahead and plan another one of these free webinars. We're going to do um, uh, talk about the topic for that. And then we're also going to have some paid webinars coming up over the winter. So get ready to uh, get, in, get your learning pants on and, uh, and get ready for next year. Thanks for being here. See you, everybody.